Hello, everyone, and welcome to Slash Film Daily for Thursday, July 25th, 2019. On today's episode, we're going to talk about the latest film and TV news. This is Slash Film Editor-in-Chief Peter Soretta. And joining me on today's podcast is Slash Film Weekend Editor Brad Oman. Hey, that's me. And Senior Writer Ben Pearson. Hey, what's going on? And Writer Chris Evangelista. Hello, folks. Okay, so we have a bunch of news to talk about today. Let's just dive right into it. Uh, let's first talk about The Mandalorian John Favreau apparently got advice from George Lucas on uh, w- while shooting this TV series. Brad, what do we know? Yes, so uh, John Favreau is executive producing the new uh, live action Star Wars series, The Mandalorian, which will be on Disney Plus in November. And George Lucas uh, visited the set during production, uh, that, as John Favreau told us sometime uh, back on Instagram. And apparently, they had uh, an extensive discussion about you know, uh, approaching Star Wars and Lucas's advice to John Favreau uh, involved um, saying to remember, basically remember that the audience for all stories and myths is the kids that are coming of age. And he takes that inspiration from uh, Joseph Campbell's The Hero with a Thousand Faces, specifically Joseph Campbell's approach to the hero's journey, which is uh, a sort of guideline that a lot of writers uh, and storytellers follow as far as a hero's journey uh, throughout an adventure. Yeah. Uh, and, they, and, and then uh, George continued to tell John that you need to have it be about politics and the Senate. The kids really like that. Trade routes and, and all that fun fun stuff he <laughs> specifically mentioned. Um, but yeah, so it, very, very basic uh, advice. And that, that is kind of something when you look at George Lucas's uh, work in Star Wars, something that he did adhere to, and maybe a little bit too much when it comes to the prequels. I think that the, the prequels themselves feel a little bit more towards kids than even the original Star Wars trilogy did. Um, and I would, I would, so- I would argue you'd, you'd see that even with, like, Return of the Jedi. I think, like, once he started selling toys, he started to see what the target market or his target market was. Absolutely. Um, but uh, as we've seen with the footage they showed from The Mandalorian uh, at Star Wars Celebration, this isn't necessarily a series that is explicitly geared towards kids. Um, but Favreau's approach to it is just more along the lines of uh, giving them, giving kids the lessons that adults learn and passing them on. Cause Favreau also said, quote, "Uh, we enjoy the stories as adults, but really storytelling is about imparting the wisdom of the previous generations onto the children who are becoming adults and giving them a context for how to behave and how to learn the lessons of the past without making mistakes on their own. That's the hope that you can teach them how to avoid all the hardship, but garner all the wisdom. And so that's that's a very general you know approach to coming of age stories that you see you know in movies ranging from you know uh, small family uh, dramas to you know big epic ad- adventures, and it's uh, it'll be interesting to see if George Lucas' advice is something that actually comes into play in the Mandalorian, uh, or if you know Favreau still kind of had his own vision when working on it. This is interesting because I heard Favreau's approach was remaking Star Wars shot by shot, but in photorealism. Uh, that's an interesting <laughs> idea. <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm just uh, all with the bad jokes today. Um, <laughs> no, it, it, the footage you saw at Star Wars Celebration, and I, I watched illegally uh, videotaped online, looked very adult to me. Yes, absolutely. Uh, it, it does feel like uh, a more mature series that is uh, along the lines of the original Star Wars. The universe feels very lived in um much like the the kind of like when you're in the setting of mos eisley cantina that's basically the vibe that you felt it felt like a star wars gangster movie yeah um it'll be interesting to see if any of the advice is actually employed in this uh series on disney plus uh okay let's move on to rocky sylvester stallone does not want rocky to die he wants another rocky sequel and maybe even a rocky prequel chris what do we know yeah, so uh, Sylvester Stallone has a really bad habit of not being able to let the past go. Uh, case in point, there's a new Rambo movie coming out this year, even though there probably really shouldn't be another Rambo movie. But uh, even though the Creed movies, you know, especially Creed 1 and to a lesser extent Creed 2, did a really good job of, of passing the torch and sort of putting a, a cap on on the Rocky franchise. There's apparently another Rocky sequel in the works, not even a Creed sequel, but a Rocky sequel that Sylvester Stallone is, is currently writing and in, in talks to star in. And in this movie, uh, Rocky 
ends up training a young boxer who's also um, an illegal immigrant. So it has that sort of like timely fashion to it. But at the same time, this, the, the premise is literally Rocky training a young, angry fighter. And that's literally the same plot as Creed. So I don't really know what they're doing here or why they thought this would be a good idea other than, you know, money, obviously. But, uh, you know, that that's that. Um, Stallone also said that he has ideas for a Rocky prequel TV series, which probably isn't going to happen because even though everyone associates Rocky with Stallone, he doesn't actually own the character. It's owned by Ir- Irwin Winkler, the producer, and he has the final say in, in everything. And apparently Ir- Erlen Winkler doesn't like the idea of a, of a TV show. And he's right. There shouldn't be a Rocky TV show. What, what would but... even a Rocky prequel TV show be about? It would just be about him like walking through the streets of Philadelphia, not being a good fighter. I get, I mean, at the start of Rocky, he's like this low level enforcer for like a, a bookie, like a debt collector. So he goes around beating people up. So I guess that's what the show would be like young Rocky trying to collect money from people. I don't know what else it could be because we already saw the Rocky origin story in Rocky. I mean, isn't, isn't there like an underground fight club that he's like kind of a part of? Not like a fight club, like David Fincher style, but like, uh, you know, un- kind of underground boxing matches. I mean, yeah, I guess, yeah, but, you know, the the first Rocky is the movie that shows him having any sort of, like, arc, I guess. I don't know what the, you know, what the story would be. Like, <laughs> yeah. he's just getting into into really shitty fights what, what for if, an entire season. What if the first season is a prequel, and then the second season is actually Rocky 1, and then they actually just do a season of TV remaking these Rocky movies, but, like, more fully fleshed out? No, I don't like it. <laughs> Yeah, that's a terrible idea. I'd rather, I'd, rather, I'd rather see a prequel series about the meat in the ice locker. Uh, well, maybe you will soon. <laughs> um, it follows on. that cow that ends up <laughs> as the meat in the ice locker. I mean, the meat the meat did get its own action figure a while back. So wait, it did. <laughs> yeah, there's actually there, they literally released an action figure in the uh, there was a Rocky action figure line years ago, and they released one that was literally just the frozen cut of meat that he punches. That is crazy. Okay, let, let's move on to NBC Universal. They're starting a streaming service. We have learned it will debut in April. Ben, what do we know? Yeah, this one's a weird one for me. So NBC Universal, like Disney Plus, like HBO Max, like Apple TV Plus, is going to be uh, launching a new streaming service directly to consumers and like you mentioned it's going to be debuting in april of 2020 um once the office wraps up its deal to stream on netflix uh which lasts all the way through 2020 that show is going to become basically like the prized possession of this new nbc universal streaming service but the interesting thing here is that uh ceo steve burke on an earnings call today announced that basically NBC's streaming service is going to be focusing on licensed content with a little bit of original programming, but not necessarily funding a ton of shows right out of the gate like a lot of these competitors are. And to me, that seems like a huge flex because, you know, even even a site like Disney Plus, which uh, or or a service like Disney Plus, which Disney has arguably the most impressive back catalog of any studio in the modern era is spending tons and tons of money on original shows to try to give audiences more bang for their buck and nbc universal by saying that they are not going to be spending a lot of money on original programming and basically just leaning on the content that they have and licensing content from outside sources is basically just them saying yeah, we're just, you know, we know that you love The Office. We know that that's one of the most popular shows, if not the most popular show streaming on Netflix right now. So we're just going to put that on our service and we know that you're going to come, you know, crawl over and, and subscribe to us because everybody can't live without The Office. So But, that's but little thing. do they know, Ben, you are not going to subscribe. Uh, I mean, unless they really kick up their original programming to a point where they have a bunch of stuff that, you know, becomes a, a major draw where it's like practically like you can't live without watching these major shows that they're making, then absolutely not. Because I still subscribe to the cable. And if I want to watch The Office, I just turn on Comedy Central because there's reruns there all day, every day, basically. Um, so this, this and it's a weird thing, too, like the idea of um, 
the quote is that of a quote vast majority end quote of their of the content on their new service is supposed to be acquired from outside the company and this is 2019 and that sounds just like what netflix did at the very beginning of the streaming era so that tactic did, did not work for netflix they realized that they would need original content to keep people hooked when all of those other companies decided to start their own thing and, and sort of like came back and and grabbed all of their toys and took them home so i have no idea what the uh, longevity of this approach for a streaming service is going to be. Chris, you covered the streaming beat for SlashFilm.com. Does a streaming service need original content to drag people in? I don't think it does, but, you know... I mean, you, you do if... subscribe to Shutter, and that's the majority of that. I mean, they just started doing some original stuff, right? Right, and one of the things I, I've come to be annoyed with about Netflix is they have less and less for lack of a better word, old stuff and every like they're, they're pushing out stuff, you know, you want to watch stuff you recognize to make way for their originals. And, you know, some of those originals are good, but a lot of times I just want to watch something, you know, <sighs> I want to watch a movie that exists. I don't want to watch, you know, the Netflix movie. And I, I, you know, I'm not against the idea of a streaming service that doesn't, have to have originals you know i you know like perfect example for that is um the criterion channel like nothing on that is original except for like little short introductory segments but that's all it, it's funny know. i had the criterion channel for a month and i i unsubscribed because i just didn't have the time to watch any of the programming but the program i did watch were like those segments where they sit down with filmmakers and actors to talk about like their favorite movies which i guess is the only original programming on that service yeah. Well, it's interesting. Like, you know, I, I agree with Chris. I, I subscribe to the Criterion channel and I, I've loved what I've seen from that so far. But like, it's the combination here of NBC Universal deciding not to spend a lot of money on original programming and then also having the vast majority of their stuff being acquired from outside the company. If they were to just sit back and be like, we're only, ha you know, going to be uh, showing Comcast, NBC Universal content on this service then that would be one thing but the fact that they're still licensing outside stuff just seems like a, a really weird way to approach this in 2019 when that lesson seems to have been learned by somebody else elsewhere you know it's weird even the the nbc universal content like i recently went on the tram tour at universal studios and once you get onto that tram tour they take you down this hill to to keep you entertained while you're going down this gigantic hill. They have these posters on either side of the tram and one poster for every year of uh, Universal's history. And it's amazing how many like huge movies Universal has been part of until you reach like the last like few decades. <laughs> it gets kind of sad. Um, so I'm wondering, do they have enough to outside of like this, you know, obviously people like, the tv stuff but like is there enough in terms of films to get people interested i don't know i mean i i would think that they would be trying to you know like the the universal horror like the the classic monster movies and stuff yeah. like lean lean on that you know like that's like you're talking about like that's their legacy that's the stuff that um but, but how many people maybe, are interested in yeah the that's old... the thing maybe maybe modern you know streaming audiences people who who primarily use streaming as a way to consume content but maybe the the venn diagram of people who are interested in universal monsters and people who uh primarily stream stuff maybe the the center sliver there is is very small i don't know speaking of monsters let's talk about the creator of monsters guillermo del toro he was going to do hellboy 3 and that did not happen instead we got uh probably a much worse hellboy movie uh and apparently he wanted to turn his version of hellboy 3 into a comic but that was denied brad what do we know yes for years guillermo del toro wanted to get hellboy 3 off the ground uh was never really in the cards though universal wasn't interested in keeping the series going because it was too expensive and the box office returns weren't enough to warrant uh, completing the trilogy that Del Toro had planned. And uh, they tried for the longest time. He tried to get fans to support it so that Universal could see that people wanted it, but it just didn't come through. And so Del Toro approached Hellboy creator Mike Vignell with the idea of turning it into a comic book so fans could see the story uh, play out as Del Toro intended. But apparently 
Mike Mignola was not up to uh, that idea. He said, quote, I think Del Toro mentioned it once to me, and I said no. I think let the comics be comics. Comics are confusing enough for people. Let's not have two different versions of the Hellboy comic out there. My vote would be to say no. Uh, so thanks, Mike Mignola. That's great. Um, you know, it it seems like it's, he's really unhappy with what Guillermo del Toro did with Hellboy. Yeah, I, the Hellboy, Guillermo del Toro's adaptation, uh, as beloved as it is, is not a loyal adaptation of the comic. The Hellboy comic is uh, much more horror-based, uh, but a little bit grittier, a little bit bloodier, and del Toro opted for a more uh, fantasy kind of approach to it. And it's uh, it's something that Mignola, you know, will will has kind of pretended that he didn't really have a problem with, but they did have cre- some creative clashing, and it seems that it's created a rift between them, and that's that's probably the biggest reason why Mignola doesn't want to do that. Um, it's it certainly shouldn't be because people are confused by there being two different versions of Hellboy because that's what they just did with the movies, and no one gave a shit. <laughs> so it's it is what it is. Uh, I'm I'm you know I'm bummed. I, I like the first two Hellboy movies. I think the second one's even better than the first one. It's you know it's pure Del Toro uh, tackling cool comic book style storytelling, and I would have loved to have seen uh, where where it went in the third installment. And it's it really is just a shame that we don't get to see how it plays out. By the way, I I think I, I want to see more comic book versions of movies that weren't made. I think like Kevin Smith did one, didn't he? Like oh, was it his Superman? Or something? I, do you recall? Uh, I actually don't remember, but I, I I do know that there are some out there. There yeah. there, re- there was even some excitement recently when Marvel was teasing that new J.J. Uh, Abrams Spider-Man project that he's doing with his son for an, a new comic. And a lot of people thought that it might be uh, a, a comic adaptation of Sam Raimi's Abandoned Spider-Man 4. And people were so excited about that, but then it just didn't happen. <laughs> okay. Wait, how would it be Spider-Man if it's Superman? No, no, I was saying that as another example. Oh, okay. Um, well, speaking of alternate versions of movies, uh, Once Upon a Time in Hollywood comes to theaters tomorrow, and we've, we're already hearing about some of the casting that could have been. Chris, who who could have been in this Tarantino movie? Well, back back when before the film even had a title, um, it was going through – uh, all all this potential casting. I remember because I wrote up most of it myself where every every day it seemed like another name was being thrown around as as a potential uh, cast member to this this big movie. And um, before Leonardo DiCaprio and Brad Pitt ended up being you know the final two leads, one of the names that did get mentioned was, was Tom Cruise. And um, we weren't sure if that was a rumor, if that was just a possibility if tom cruise rejected it blah 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 but it, it turns out um tom cruise definitely was on tarantino's list and tarantino actually did talk to him about the role and so here's what happened there there's you know there's a lengthy interview with tarantino where he talks about the casting process and the way he was approaching it was he was looking at people who would be perfect pairs in other words two lead actors who would go together really well because the two lead actors, they're supposed to complement each other in the sense that one of them, Leonardo DiCaprio's character is an actor and Brad Pitt is his stunt man. Yeah. And, and this Grant, is very much a buddy picture, right? Right. Yeah. And they have to have the right chemistry together. They have to sort of look the same, you know, obviously DiCaprio and Pitt don't look the same, but they have sort of the same sort of, physical presence so that it would make somewhat sense for brad pitt to be leonardo dicaprio's stunt double but the role that uh tarantino wanted tom cruise to play would be brad pitt's character and obviously tom cruise and leonardo dicaprio do not look anything alike so that would be really uh jarring and weird so what this boiled down to basically was dicaprio and pitt were always tarantino's number one choices but if one of them wasn't available, then he would not have cast the other one. And then he had he said he had eight different pairs in mind. So that's like 16 people in mind oh. for the, these two leads if Pitt or DiCaprio weren't available. And one of them was Tom Cruise. Um, he didn't reveal who the others are. And I'm really dying to know what those other pairs would have been. I'm, I'm hoping one day we get an answer to that. I want to see I, that list. Yeah. So um, who knows if I ever call him up again because he's a good friend of mine, I'll, I'll ask him who those <laughs> those 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 other lit people are. I mean, you still have his number on speed dial, right? 
I do. I, I actually did save it. So maybe yeah. one day I'll, I'll just call him and say, hey, buddy, remember me? Yeah, just hold down the number day. one and it'll start ringing. <laughs> yeah. Um, also, we learned that um, James Marsden was originally going to play Burt Reynolds. Right. That was another um, cast member who did get announced as being in the film. Um uh, but he's not in the final film and it's not really clear if he actually shot his scenes or if he didn't even get to set, if his stuff got cut before filming even began. But uh, James Marsden was going to play Burt Reynolds in the film, which is extra interesting because Burt Reynolds was actually going to be in the film too, but he died before shooting began and his part was um, taken over by Bruce Dern. So yeah, there's 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 all sorts of things we don't know about this movie that I'm sure will be coming out over the years because that seems to happen with Tarantino movies that every every few years he talks about something he made in the past and we learn a bunch of stuff. So I'm guessing like three years from now, we're going to learn a whole bunch of new stuff about this movie that we don't know right now. Did, did you see in the credits, Tim Roth had a credit and then next to it just in uh, it just said cut. So apparently he was. He, f- he filmed a part in this film, but he didn't appear in the movie, but he still got a credit. Right. Yeah. I, I, he was another one that did get announced as being part of the cast. There were a few other people that got like Danny Strong, the actor who was on yeah. Buffy the Vampire Slayer, got cast, but he got cut as well. So who knows? Who knows who else is out there who didn't make it into that final cut? It's so strange to see someone get a credit for a role that's not even in the movie, though. Like You, you usually don't see that. I mean, it has yeah. happened, but yeah. yeah. Um, okay, let's move on to HBO. They, the TCAs are going on, and we've learned a little bit about Watchmen, the new series from Damon Lindelof. Ben, what do we know? Yeah, there's a ton of information uh, that was given at this Watchmen panel at the Television Critics Association, and um, I'll bring up some of the most interesting stuff, um, the first of which is that The show takes place in 2019, but it's obviously an alternate version where all of the events of the Watchmen comic happened. So we've known that much. Um, One of the things that we did not know, though, is that Robert Redford is the president of the United States in this alternate version of the show. Um, Apparently, he was elected to uh, to the office of president in 1992 and then is still the president because in this world they've abolished term limits, which is like a really terrifying thing. uh, Sounds like such a good idea. Yeah. um, And it's interesting because Redford is sort of like this – you know, there obviously there's a conservative celebrity who is in power right the second, but uh, Redford is a, a liberal celebrity, and um, Fred, who Fred Topel, who is covering the TCAs for us, mentioned in his piece that uh, this is an interesting idea because Lindelof is basically taking the position that a beloved celebrity with liberal politics could still you know, get the country into just as a bad a, a place as it is right now, you know, in, in, in this fictional world. He's not trying to um, to necessarily draw a line between those two, but say that there are bigger problems than just who is in office. Um, there's also some interesting stuff in here about how that the internet does not exist in this world, or if it does, then it's not accessible by people because nobody has smartphones. Apparently the Redford administration stepped in to make sure that, <laughs> that we couldn't troll each other. Um, by, and by the way, do we know if Redford's actually playing himself in this? I don't show? know. I, I, I would guess that he's not going to appear um, <laughs> like as himself or that the president, you know, that nobody is going to play him. He's just going to be like a figure sort of looming in the background. Um, I have to assume that Lindelof like spoke with him and like got the rights to use his likeness and name and all that stuff. But I don't know. Um, that's an interesting thing. Somebody will have to ask that in an upcoming interview, I'm sure. Um, but that, uh, you know, uh, one of the other quotes that I thought was really interesting from Lindelof, he says, um, when I started thinking about what Watchmen was going to be in the original source material, the book was highly political. It was about what was happening in American culture at the time, even though it was presented by two British artists. What in 2019 is the equivalent of the nuclear standoff between the Russians and the United States? It felt that it was undeniably race and policing in America. So those are going to be two of the the big like tenets that this show sort of hangs itself on. Um, there's like white supremacy is a big uh, through line of this thing. So it sounds like he's he's tackling with some you know some really really big ideas. Um, and and one last quote that I wanted to read. Um, somebody asked. 
I think, uh, are the police going to be presented in a, a heroic light in this show? And the cops are, are wearing masks. We saw that in the, the most recent trailer. Um, Lindelof said, uh, the answer is most certainly no. Watchmen is not interested in talking about who the heroes, villains, good guys, and bad guys are. It's an examination of institutions and politics. So, yeah, that sounds like a, a really... Um, ambitious idea that is going probably going to piss off a lot of people um but it sounds like the kind of thing that i'm i'm really excited about like this is the kind of thing that i think all of us have wanted from a major piece of intellectual property is not just a slavish recreation of it but taking the ideas that were embedded in the original text and sort of like uh evolving them into the modern era and exploring what that means so i'm, I'm really excited about the show the show is so weird because I feel like when it was announced, all of us were like, why? Like, we thought it was a bad idea. And then the more and more I hear about the show, the more and more I it sounds like it's going to be my new favorite show. Uh, Chris, what, what are your thoughts on Watchmen? Uh, I, I'm pretty interested in it. Uh, the, the, the latest trailer in particular really caught my attention. So I'm very curious to see how it turns out. It, it looks like it has a very unique take on the source material without being like you know a straight adaptation it looks like it's using the the you know the tone and the spirit of the comic to to make something uh new and interesting so i'm looking forward to it i really wonder if people are gonna have to read the comic the original comics to understand what's going on here like i feel like i need to i have like one of those huge absolute volumes I need, I need to pull that off my shelf and reread it before this airs because I, I don't remember who's who and what's what in this world. Uh, you know, I, I think in my memory, I probably uh, remember the Zack Snyder Watchmen film better than I do the comics at this point. Uh, Brad, do you have any love for the Watchmen? Um, you know, it's one of those things where uh, I my relationship to the comic is I've read it once and I haven't picked it up since then, so I don't remember a lot about it either. I, I've probably seen the movie, I don't know, uh, a few times. Uh, in, uh, I saw it in theaters and then I I would put it on HBO like in the background whenever it was on a few different times. But uh, yeah, it's it's not something that I have um, a big love for or anything like that. But I am very intrigued about what this series is doing and how it's digging into the material. And li like Ben said, kind of presenting it uh, for um, with a modern twist. And I, I hope that what it has to say is, you know, interesting enough to, to keep watching and that it's not something that, uh, you know, thinks that it's provocative and uh, intriguing, but is really just like, meh. <laughs> yeah. Okay, we have one last story to talk about today. This is something I think we've talked about in the past. Movie theaters are considering variable and dynamic pricing models. Brad, what do we know? Yes, uh, in case you haven't noticed, the uh, the box office isn't doing so hot this year. Uh, a lot of movies are coming in with opening weekends less than expectations. Audiences aren't turning out as much as they were last year. And some of that blame seems to fall on the fact that uh, Movie Pass is pretty much defunct now. That would seem to be what was the driving force for some bigger crowds last year because it was so easy for them to get tickets and not have to pay a lot for them. And uh, it seems in the wake of that, with numbers being down for attendance, theaters are, have been uh, mostly just discussing the idea of introducing uh, either or uh, variable pricing or dynamic pricing. Uh, and the difference between those is this. Uh, the variable pricing... Uh, would be a model that you would say, take a movie like uh, Stuber that just recently came out. A ticket for Stuber would probably cost less than something like a ticket for Avengers Endgame. Avengers Endgame would be considered a big event movie, have a higher ticket price, whereas Stuber is a smaller movie where the, the audience isn't expected to be as big, and so you would pay less for it, and hopefully that would get uh, more butts in those seats because the ticket doesn't cost as much. Um, there's, there is some controversy around this, though, because... Uh, it is believed by some analysts that if uh, you're charging a lower price for a movie, then you're basically coming out and saying, we don't think this movie is as good as a movie that you would pay $15 for. It's more of an $8 movie. Um, but at the same time, I feel like Stuber is the kind of movie where um, they, it specifically shows in this uh, Hollywood Reporter article where this information came from that the attendance for the audience going to see Stuber increased greatly on what is uh, has been called Discount Tuesdays. A lot of theater chains have a discount day on Tuesday 
where the ticket price is usually around five dollars. And the attendance for Stuber went up considerably on Tuesday on a day that is normally not very high uh, unless, unless the discount is in place. That actually may almost made as much on Discount Tuesday as it did on its opening day when it came out. So audiences are already looking at a movie and thinking, oh, that's not worth this price of admission. I'll wait and see it on a discount day. So I feel like it's a, it's a pricing model that you know could end up working. And it's actually something that... Steven Spielberg and George Lucas had talked about all the way back in 2013. They were talking about how it seemed like the industry was coming up on this uh, implosion when a lot of mega budget movies would start to fail and they would have to rethink the distribution model. And Spielberg proposed the idea that you you would pay something like $25 for the next Iron Man, but then you would only pay like $7 to see a movie like Lincoln, which was coming out at the time. Uh, and so they, they talked about how a lot of these smaller movies might end up going to television or something like that, too. And it was uh, definitely very uh, prescient of them to see that because that's kind of where we're at now with Netflix releasing a lot of movies uh, through the streaming service, movies that otherwise wouldn't get a release in theaters or if they did, wouldn't make very much money. Um, but besides the variable pricing model, they're also considering dynamic pricing, which would be pricing where it's based on what day you're seeing a movie and what showtime. So if you're going to see a movie on opening weekend, uh, an evening show when it's most popular, you'll pay more for that ticket than you would if you saw it uh, in the evening on like a Wednesday or something like that. And uh, there's this is something that European theater chains have done for a long time, but no American chain has actually tried it yet in the, in the States to see if it's something that would work. Uh, and again, this is something where you, you kind of see that audiences are already adapting to the idea of they know when the cheaper movie times are and they'll go see a movie during those windows if it's not something that they want to see on opening weekend. They'll wait for Discount Tuesday. So if, if theaters, you know, want to try to get more butts in seats and they're not willing to change much about, you know, the the rest of their uh, model as far as expensive concessions and or, or giving them more unique theater experience, either of these options seem like a good way to do that. But at the same time, right now, most of them are focused on their own subscription plans, uh, which are working out in the wake of MoviePass and Cine uh, Cinemia dying away. AMC Theaters has a successful uh, A-list subscription plan. Regal has one coming out soon. Alamo Drafthouse has one uh, that is uh, about as close to MoviePass as any of them can get. Uh, so, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a weird, interesting time of flux for movie theaters. Yeah, it'll be interesting to see for sure how this uh, sorts out. But I, I am all for variable and dynamic pricing models. Uh, Chris, Ben, what what are your thoughts? Are are like is this something you'd be against? Just just release everything on streaming, please. I don't want to leave my <laughs> just please. I'm tired of leaving my house. Just put it right to stream. Like I. I really want to see Once uh, Upon a Time in Hollywood again, but I'm just like the, the thought of going out to the movie theater this weekend and but Chris, sitting. Chris, they might even 45... have a 70 millimeter screening near you somewhere. No, they do not. Uh... Believe me, I checked. The nearest one is probably like 5,000 miles away from me because <laughs> the movie theater industry is, is shit right now. So just put everything right on streaming. That's all I want. But Chris, My... don't, you, don't you wish you saw Aquaman on the big screen? Not really. I, can, I was fine watching it at home. Um, my thought about this is I like the idea, but I'm so um, I just don't know if it's going to happen because I think Brad sort of alluded to this earlier. But like there's so much ego in Hollywood, right, from from studios to stars to everything. And like the idea of people uh, of whoever's making these decisions, executives, whoever, uh, basically admitting defeat and saying, yep, we're an $8 movie instead of a $15 movie just seems so unlikely to me. Um, but I don't know, maybe if they could do something where like they, they all open uh, wide normally with like a normal price. And then based on the opening weekend or something, maybe that's the point where they, they make that switch because pretty much, you know, within the opening weekend, like how the movie is going to do. Um, so maybe if like, that's a way for them to sort of save face, like, uh, okay, we realize that this movie's not going to perform as well as some of our competitors. Let's try to maximize profits by doing the $8 thing instead of just like 
you know, riding this dead horse, you know, long after it's it's actually died on in, in the desert or whatever. You know what I'm saying? No, I, I agree with I agree with that perspective on the egos, but at the same time, it's kind of interesting. The one of the quotes they have in here uh, uh, in support of the um, the variable pricing is a former Fox executive who uh, actually said himself, he's like, you shouldn't have to pay as much to see Stuber as you should Avengers Endgame. So it seems like there are some executives who fully believe that this is the best way for them to get more bang for their buck. But I think it's more along the lines of like, you probably run into an ego situation with certain filmmakers or stars who think, well, why is my movie not you know being yeah. charged uh, as much for as this movie? Yeah, I wonder if that's why he's a former Fox executive. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it is tough because I do see that viewpoint of like, then are we thinking lesser than of movies that are cheaper? But on the other hand, in every other bit of, you know, if you go to the store, you are paying, you're not paying the same for every single thing. Like you are paying variable pricing based on the budget of what what it costs to produce and distribute that item. So like, why aren't movies the same way? I don't know. It just seems so strange. I'm sure. I'm sure things are gonna sort out in an interesting direction. I'm also surprised that uh, the subscription movie services like uh, AMC A List have not uh, done more for the box office this summer. But maybe, maybe it's like you know, I have AMC A List, and I have not seen that many movies this summer because there really isn't that many movies I want to see. So maybe it's the it's not about them. Maybe I guess they can't help, you know, a product that is is not uh, in demand. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I don't know. Okay. Anyways, that brings us to the end of today's Slash Film Daily. You can find more of all of our work at slashfilm.com. You can find the links to the stories we've talked about on today's podcast in the show notes. You can find this podcast published every weekday on iTunes, Google, Overcast, Spotify, all the popular podcast apps. Please feel free to send us your feedback, questions, comments, concerns to us at peter at slash film.com. And please rate and read this podcast on iTunes. Tell your friends. Spread the word. We'll see you tomorrow.